Hello, welcome to Rising Christian Bible Study. Tonight's topic, God is on your side. God is on your side. Let's explore the idea, the origins and the idea that the most powerful being in the universe, the most loving, the wisest, the most resourceful being in all the universe is on our side. Galatians 3.10 For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. The scriptures explain to us a really important concept. If you break any part of the law, you're guilty of breaking all of it. So in other words, in God's level, or at God's level of perfection, at God's level of requirement, if you break any part of the law, you're guilty of all of it. And here's the other thing I, I, I believe many people don't understand. When, when you study the scriptures, you realize Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you have, in your heart, you've committed adultery. Okay. So for you to truly keep the law, you must keep it in word, thought, and deed. In other words, God's level of perfection of what he's requiring it must be fulfilled in word, thought, and deed. Because that is truly a reflection of who you are. So you may have a certain level of self-control or perhaps you have trained yourself in certain areas. But when it's truly who you are, it will emanate out of you in word, thought, or deed, or, or all, or any combination of the three. So the Jews and mankind as a whole have shown us that no one can keep the law. When you study the history of Israel, for example, we know that the kings of Israel, when the kingdoms were divided, the kingdom of Israel, none of the kings were good. They were all bad. Now, in the, in the, Jude, the, Jude, the line of Judah that God allowed to be kept by the uh, family of David, they did have a few kings that were good. Josiah, Hezekiah, obviously King David himself, uh, even Solomon to a certain point. Unfortunately, we know uh, the Bible tells us that his heart was turned from God in his later years. Um, Asa, if I remember correctly. There were a number of kings that were good, but when you study the scriptures, what you realize is there is no one, not even the best of them, like King David, that did not have a mark against them. Not, not one king, even of the good kings, not one. Because no one can truly keep the law. And the level of perfection that God requires, requires that you're able to keep the law in word, thought, or deed. So if you break it in any way, you're guilty of all of it. So the word of God comes back and it, 
and it informs after the full analysis, it tells us, well, no one is justified by the law. What's the final conclusion? The just shall live by faith. So God gave mankind millennia to fulfill the law, and they never could. They never could. If you break any part of the law, you're guilty of all of it. That's God's level of perfection. Galatians 3, 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So God gives mankind millennia to fulfill the law. Mankind unequivocally shows we cannot do it. No one was able to do it. No one. So finally, after millennia of trying and mankind being under the curse because never being able to keep the law, what does he do? He sends his only begotten son. Now I want you to, to consider this. The almighty God, that lives in perfect perfection, perfect harmony, left that level of royalty and, and holiness and cleanness to come down and allow himself to become a curse for us. Cursed is anyone that doesn't keep all the law. So all of mankind was cursed. Because nobody could keep the law. No one. Not one person in all the New Testament and all those that were not mentioned were able to keep the law. So what does God do? He comes down, he becomes a curse for us. And what is the results of that? That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. And we're going to look at that. Abraham called a friend of God, given great promises by God, right? Those blessings now come upon all of those that are even not even the descendants of Abraham, how through Christ Jesus. And what is one of the greatest blessings of Abraham? The promise of the Spirit. I want you to think about this. Jesus told the disciples that it's expedient that I leave because if I don't leave, then the Father won't send the, he won't send the comfort. He won't send the Holy Spirit. I believe one way you can interpret, to that, interpret that is this way, to think. The same way Jesus discipled, mentored, lived with, guided, helped, answered their questions, taught them, the disciples is now the same way. We have that same access through the Holy Spirit now on this earth. So Jesus said it's expedient. So that tells me that what the, and then Jesus, he, he even took it further to say that the, but for those that truly, that believe the works he did and greater. So that means that what the disciples had, having the, the, the Son of God in the flesh, in a human body, walking amongst them, I have even greater than that now because I put my faith in Jesus Christ, and now I receive the blessings of Abraham. And so now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the infinite God, now rest resides with me the way Jesus did with the disciples. Think about that. You have the almighty God, infinite wisdom, infinite love, who cannot be tricked, cannot be fooled. You cannot sneak up on God. A being that sees all space and all time all at once. Think about that. All 200 or so billion galaxies, our God, the only true God, holds all that. And he sees all of it all at once. 
that God now resides with you. When you put your faith and trust in Christ, you make a verbal confession, you put your faith and trust in Christ, that perfect family, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that was perfect, didn't need anything, didn't need anyone. Now the Holy Spirit takes you and adopts you. He grafts you into that family. The blessings of Abraham. Side note. This is a side note. Remember that if you confess your mouth, Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart, we can hear what people confess. But unless the Holy Spirit gives you insight, we actually don't always know what they believe in their heart. So I can pray with a person or they come down to the front of the church or however you want to do on the street corner, street witnessing, whatever. And I can pray with them, right? What we like to call the sinner's prayer. Remember, that's the verbal part. But what I don't know is what do they actually believe in their heart? So this is a side note. So a person can actually say, quote, this, you know, the sinner's prayer, like, as we like to call it. But remember, it doesn't necessarily mean that they truly believe it in their heart. So it's not just what you say with your mouth, right? It's what do you believe in your heart? But the Holy Spirit knows. The Holy Spirit knows. This could explain sometimes why we, for you know, we always hear about why is it that certain people in the church or, you know, they, they confess and then they exhibit certain behaviors and lifestyles. And we're wondering, you know, well, remember, this, this is a side, complete side note, a little rabbit trail. I know what you said with your mouth, but we don't know what they believe in their heart. The true change comes with what you believe in your heart. Verbal confession is a part of it. The Bible's clear. But then, what do you believe in your heart? Right? So just remember that. But when you believe in your heart, in the Lord Jesus, you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit grafts you into the family of God. So, what are some of the results of this? Right? Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So. When you put your faith in Christ, you become a son of God. So think of the family dynamic. How is a father to his son as compared to others? Consider that. How does a father relate to, treat, prefer, his own son or daughter compared to everyone else. When you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit adopts you into the body of God and you become a son or daughter of God. A good father. Don't just, and here's another issue we have. Many people have trouble relating to the almighty father, depending on their image of their own father. Right? So if you had a, for example, a hardcore, a militaristic, a very critical very judging father. That's how you will often see God the father. So when someone comes to you and tries to relate the love, the acceptance 
of God. For some people, that's difficult for them to receive because they can only see God as a hard taskmaster. But when you come to them like, well, this, you know, with judgment, with this is why this happened to you. You need to do better. You need to, they can, they can take that in because that's how they relate to father. This is why it's important that we base our theology on the word of God and how the Holy Spirit opens up to us. Remember what Jesus said? He said to the disciples, if you being evil know how to give gifts to your children, how much your father in heaven? You, comparatively speaking, you're evil. The good father in heaven is different. You become a son. So think about that as you walk through the journey of life. Issues, hills, valleys, wherever you are, wherever you're going. Think about that. I believe in Jesus. I put my faith in Jesus. God is my father. I am not alone. No matter what is happening to me now, I am not alone. He promised to never leave me or forsake me the most powerful being in the universe, the most loving, the most kind, the most understanding is my father. And he's a good father. He's not just the father who, when you do something wrong, he whoops you. But when you do something right, he doesn't say anything to you. He never commends you. He never congratulates you. He's not that father. Or he's not the other father that's always, oh, everything's okay. And you know, he's always, you know, God is balanced. Keep that in mind. So God creates this new, remember, so at one time on this planet, there were only two categories of human beings, only two. There were Jews, as they eventually were called, or prior to that terminology coming into existence, um, the family of Abraham through his son Isaac and his grandson Israel that worshiped the God of Abraham, right? And Gentiles, everyone else. There are only, only two. God then took those two groups of people and created a new set of people. Christians, the saints, the redeemed. So now there are three categories of people on this planet Earth. Jews, Gentiles, Christians. The three those are the three categories of people that God sees on the Earth. We humans, we like to find ways to divide, our, divide ourselves. But God sees three. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the promises that God gave Abraham, which then eventually came on Isaac and then on Israel and his descendants, that promise is now given to those that are Christ. If you are in Christ, then you are an heir of Abraham. That means that uh, what, what Abraham left in his will to his heirs, you know, in the manner of speaking, now is on you. So let's look at an example of this. Let's look at an example. Genesis 12. So it was when Abraham came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So many of you know the background to the story. Abraham's going into Egypt. He's fearful. He tells his wife, Sarah, listen, you're very beautiful. That's obvious. I can see that, and they'll be able to see it. And we live in a time where men will kill you for a beautiful woman. 
So just tell everybody that you're my sister. Abraham requests of his wife. Sarah obeys Abraham. She submitted to him. There's a whole lesson in that for those that are wives, but we won't digress. He goes into Egypt, and exactly what he thought happened is what happened. They looked at her. She was obviously, you know, different. And they saw this woman and, and commented for how beautiful she was. Pharaoh took her into his harem, right? And because he believes that Abraham is her brother, what does he do? He treats her well. Now, we later learned that, in, in Abraham's own words, Sarah was his half-sister. But we all know that when that's not how he was saying it. It, it, was, a, it was a lie. Okay, fine, a half-lie, but it was still a lie. He lied. So what does Pharaoh do? This woman is very beautiful. Obviously, I want her affections. I want her to love me too. I want. So what do I do? I treat her brother well. And what does Pharaoh do? Give him sheep, oxen, increases his wealth. But this is not his sister. This is actually his wife. So Abraham lied. That's just the reality of it. No matter how you turn it. God knows he lied. Abraham and Sarah knew. At that time, Pharaoh didn't. But he lied. What are we talking about? We're talking about the blessings of Abraham. We're talking about becoming an heir of Abraham. Genesis 12, 17. But the Lord, but excuse me, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's Abram's wife. He wasn't called Abraham. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So I want you to look at this. Abraham tells a lie. He does it out of fear. Right? Pharaoh blesses Abraham because he's thinking this is his sister. Pharaoh comes to the realization that this is not your sister. This is your wife. And what does he do? Sends him away, away in peace and with his wife and watch this and, and lets him keep everything that he had. So even though Abraham was being deceptive, God used it to actually increase his wealth and riches. He turned it around in his faith. So Abraham actually left richer than he did when he was when he came to Egypt. And he got his wife back. And they let him keep everything that was given to him. So we see that when you put your faith and trust in God, when you believe in Jesus, you become a son of God. You become an heir of Abraham. And what happens? What is one of the, the consequences? God is on your side to the extent that even when you make a mistake or an error or you deliberately Sin, what is God doing? He's still watching over you for your betterment. He's turning everything around, even the things that you're at fault for. He's turning it around and working it out in your favor. He promises to never leave you or forsake you. The Bible tells us that the work that God begins in us, he will complete it. 
it will be completed. When you put your faith and trust in God, you become an heir of Abraham, and now you have the backing of the Almighty God. Now that so that doesn't mean that God, how would you say it, that he excuses sin or it's promoting sin. It means that regardless of your, all, your own frailties and your sin nature, God is there with you and he's helping you and he's working it out in your favor. Hebrews 4. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same textings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Now, I downloaded this in the New Living Translation because I thought it really brought it out. So consider this. God gets us. He gets us. We cannot turn to God and say, you don't get, you don't, you don't understand what I'm going through. You're an almighty God. You're perfect. You've never lost. Right? You, don't, you don't know what it's like to struggle. You don't know what it's like to feel pain. You don't know what it's like to be me. This is something that mankind can actually no longer say. Why? Because Jesus Christ came down as a human being. And now as his... Because of his experience as a human being, he understands our weaknesses. What does it say? For he faced all of the same testings we do. But watch this. Yet he did not sin. So Jesus proved that you can experience human life, the weaknesses, the testings, and yet not sin. So we have a high priest. We have a high priest that we can go to that gets us. We have a high priest that understands what it's like to struggle as a human being. So, and because of that, right, he's merciful. Well, he's merciful because that's his nature. But directly in this context, it's like Jesus can say to us, I understand. I understand. I was... Now I want you to think about this. The richest being in all creation, the most powerful being in all creation, allowed himself to descend to the level of a human being. But not just that. To be beaten, abused, spit on, rejected. And then on top of that, the ultimate shame to be killed for us, for you, for me, that's what the almighty God did for us. Now, I don't know you, but if I had unlimited resources, I would probably shield myself against certain negative experiences. That's just me, the, me, the human talking. I would shield myself against negative experience. I'd have the, the best security, best gated house, weapons, whatever it takes. You, no, you're, you're not robbing me. You're not abusing me. You're not, no, that's not going to happen. I would build my life. Just talking as a human, talking from a, you know the carnal mindset, I would build my life in such a way. Cars and clothes, you know the things we do. No one would reject me. Although we all know that's not true, no matter who you are and how much things you accumulate, you are always susceptible to rejection. But just, you know, giving an example, which this is what I think people do, men in particular, we build up these structures around, our, you know, the car, the house, the clothes, the Rolex watch, the Gucci shoes, you know, 
we we prop ourselves up in a way that you know to gain maximum acceptance to have the most people desire us right we don't just get a ferrari we get the loud you know we put the loudest muffler on it we you know we want to be seen we want to be accepted and it's human but this being went the other way he could have done that he could have set up in a way where rejection was impossible and and I can tell you as a man, all human beings know this, but men in particular, rejection does not feel good. I can honestly say that it is a highly overrated experience. Or another way I would say it is, it sucks. <laughs> Nobody likes being rejected. Yeah. Nobody likes being rejected. I hate rejection. But this God who could have kept himself from ever being rejected willingly allowed it. He could have called legions of angels and stopped what was happening, but he didn't. That's the God we serve. That's the conduit we have to the almighty God. We have to remind ourselves of this. Turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Turn to God through Jesus Christ. He gets it. He understands. So now, so let's summarize. So keep in mind, if you break any part of the law, then you are guilty of breaking all of the law. What's the idea here amongst many ideas? If you set your mind and your heart and your will to perfectly keep the law through your own willpower, you're setting yourself up for failure. This has been proven by humanity for thousands of years. The Jews, prophets, many of them who saw things and levels of miracles that we only hear about now in legend. Yet they fell. The idea isn't for me to try to use my willpower to keep the law. You're going to fail. The idea is to keep seeing more of Jesus, which allows the Holy Spirit to change me in my heart. So in my heart, I become more like God. And you know what will happen? I will continuously more and more keep the law just by being myself. Why? Because the self that I am being is more like Jesus, which is more like God. Jesus perfectly kept the law. So the more I become like Jesus, the more I will be, I will keep the law. So I won't just not commit adultery or fornicate in physical deed, but in my heart, I won't want to do it because it's not who I am. As I've said in previous Bible studies, you are who you are in your heart. There are people that may have not told a lie, but they're liars because that's who they are in their heart. So they, and, and eventually it comes out depending on the pressure and the level of, you know, self-control per se, but who you are will come out now, later. Right? And that's what God looks at. Who are you in your heart? To truly keep the law, you must keep it in word, thought, and deed. That's a re to keep the law at God's level of perfection and requirement, you must keep it in word, thought, and deed. So if in any one of those areas, if you sin, you sin in all of the areas. You know what the Bible is teaching? You know what the Word of God is teaching us? That Jesus, the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, came to this earth and perfectly kept the law in word, thought, and deed. In Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, he committed no sin. In him was no sin, and he did no sin. So the more I become like him, the more that will become true of me. All Gentiles, all Gentiles non-Jews, can receive the blessing of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. I gave you that, and that's one tiny example 
of what the blessings of Abraham can look like. That even when you screw up, God can back you and help you. Even when you screw up, right? We live in a fallen world. That's just the reality of it. I'm learning more and more to not be so shocked and surprised by the behavior of sinners. Because we live in a fallen world. What you see in this world, the disjointedness, is because the world is in a fallen state. And as a result, mankind is in a disjointed, a fallen state. Jesus said it this way, which I think almost it's perfect. No one is good but God. No one. You think you're good. I may think I'm good, but you're not. And typically, it just takes the right situation or circumstances to bring out who you really are. We've all heard those stories of how, you know, or let's say a plane goes down, crashes somewhere in a mountain. The people are isolated. They haven't been rescued. They're starving. And they start eating the dead bodies. I know that's a far-fetched example, but, but the idea is well, I would never do that. I don't care. No, you, you don't know what you may or may not do. You have no idea what you may or may not do, depending on the circumstances and situation. There's no telling what you and I may or may not do. The prayer is, God, bless me that I'm, I'm never in a situation where the worst of me comes out. You know, all mankind, there are no good guys. There are no justice leagues. There are no Avengers. No, there are no Captain Americas and Superman. It's, but no, the reality is all of us are Dark Side or Thanos, Doctor Doom. These are for you who have read comic books. I know that um, that'll be my nerd or geek reference for, for the day. We're all the on the we think we're on the side of the good. No, you're on the side of the Joker, the Riddler, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, um, Hitler, Wicked Eve. Yeah, now I know, I know people. Well, come on, I'm nothing like Hitler. Okay, well, perhaps your depravity has not reached that level. But trust me, outside of Jesus Christ, we're all depraved. And only God truly knows to what level that depravity, that depravity could descend under the right circumstances. But thank God for Jesus. Thank God for the blood of Christ that cleanses us of all sins. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become an heir of Abraham and a son of God. I've discussed that. Study the life of Abraham. See how God backed him. See how God protected him. There's Abraham with 300 men fought five armies, if I remember correctly. When they, they, they invaded the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, that area, and took Lot. Abraham's nephew. The Bible says Lot took 300 of his men, went and fought five armies and defeated them. God is on your side. I like that saying that anytime it's you and God, you're always in the majority. 300 men against five armies, the 300 men win. Why? Because God was on their side. God supported, helped, and protect, and protected, excuse me, Abraham despite his errors. So this is important. This is important. Why is this important? Because this helps to give us confidence that even despite our own frailties and our own errors, our own sin nature, God will never leave me or forsake me. And, and watch this. And God can protect me even against myself, which when you think about it is often the
the one you need the greatest protection against is you. You, we've heard this in many ways, when you really think about it, are your greatest enemy. Because even at this point in our existence, Satan, evil angels, demons, have it actually stripped of the vast majority of their power. Because Jesus said all might and all power has been given to, into his hand. He has the keys of hell and death. Or death and hell, right? So even much of the power that Satan, evil angels, demons had prior to the coming Christ, the vast majority has been stripped. They do still have the power of influence and also to the extent and degree they're given power by the actions and behaviors of humans, right? So really, your greatest enemy is you. My greatest enemy is me. Yes, demons exist. Um, devils, you know. Yes. But they, they're they very limited. And often that limitation is taken off by our own human actions. Okay. So side note, don't fool around with Ouija boards and, and spells and... <laughs> And all these things that people are doing and chants and, you know, now you mess with that stuff if you want to, but just remember, whatever doors you open, that's on you. Don't, don't fool around with that stuff with black magic and dark arts and all this stuff. You're going to let something into your life and then, yeah, and we've heard the stories. Personally, eh, no thank you. That's a side note, but just remember that what the forces of darkness were before, they have great, been greatly weakened. So really, your greatest enemy is yourself. Although Jesus Christ is God, he understands and can sympathize with all humans. How comforting is that? I have to remind myself of that. I admonish you to do the same. Meditate on that throughout the day. Jesus gets me. Jesus understands me. Lean on that. If you have an issue, if you're going through something, lean on that. God is not in heaven twiddling his thumbs confused. God is not in heaven. Like, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? You know, that's not that's not God's energy and um I believe mindset towards us. He understands. The infinite God understands because he became a human being. He gets it. And now he's saying, I but I had all those testings exposed to all those weaknesses, but yet I did not sin. Right? What did Jesus admonish us to do, take his joke on us. His joke is easy and his burdens are light. If, you're, if your life is hard and heavy, I would, I would admonish you, ask you to think that that's not Jesus. That's probably you. Jesus said that his joke was easy and his burdens are light. This idea that the Christian life is hard and heavy and dark and you know and depressing and defeat i think that's actually the work of the the mind of men not of christ god said his jesus said his his yoke is easy and his burdens are light. what did jesus said my peace i live with, i leave with you jesus said my peace i live with you believe the word of god you know what the word of god says it says happy is he who's in such a case happy is he whose god is the lord if your Christianity in your life is one of depression and sadness, I would question if it's e truly inspired by the Holy Spirit. Something to think about, something to med on, meditate on. And finally, faith in Christ gives you access to the throne of the Almighty God. Let's all keep that in mind. I need to keep that in mind.
I have access to the Almighty. So what, remember, when you're praying, think about that. God is listening to you. Your feelings, your emotions, and your happenings might tell you he's not listening. Why is this happening to me? God has abandoned me. If God were with this wouldn't happen, that is a lie. What does Satan call? What is one of, his name is Diablo, which if I'm correct, is translated as the stone thrower, meaning they throw thoughts into your mind. Well, why? Well, if this is the case, then you say God is with you. Then why is this? Why is that? I'm learning this. God has helped me. He put this into your mind. Don't be ruled by your feelings. I know it is easy to say. I know that. Feelings go up and down. Right? Be ruled by the facts of the, of the Bible. Your feelings might tell you God has abandoned me. Your feelings. See, feelings are funny. I can show you a picture for some of you of something like, let's say, your children or grandchildren or uh, you, you graduate from college, a happy time, right? I can show you a picture of that, and it'll bring joy to your heart. You'll feel happy. Your, your, your feelings will feel happy. And right after that, I could pull that picture away. If I know you, I understand you, and show you another picture, perhaps of an, of an ex that broke your heart or of an incident, you know? And your whole feeling, your whole dynamic will change in just that moment. That's the nature of feelings. They're up and down. All right. So part of what the Holy Spirit is teaching me and you is don't be ruled by your feelings. You must rule your feelings. And trust me, I know that is a work of the Holy Spirit, which is why we need to keep seeing more of Jesus. Because your feelings will have you all over the place. Your feelings. We're almost done. Remember Elijah? Elijah had this great victory. Fire fell down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. How many people have ever seen such a miracle? Fire fell down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. He killed the prophets of Baal. Jezebel hears this, sends him a message and says to him, fine, trust me, I'm going to do to you what you did to him. And what did Elijah do? He took off running. Took off running after such a great victory. Yeah, it's the human condition, just the nature. Feeling, right? Fear. Don't live by your feelings, right? Live by the facts of the gospel of Christ. Faith in Christ gives you access to the throne of the almighty God. Awesome. So keep this in mind. To any that are not Christians, my prayer is that you would become a Christian. Just try to think about that. What I'm saying to you, that the infinite, all-powerful God, who is love, God is love. Yes, he is a fearful and, and, and a fearsome God, but God is love. He's infinitely wise. He has infinite resources. That God made the ultimate sacrifice so that he can connect with you. And that God is now saying to me, to, to you, to all human beings everywhere, come to me. Come to me. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to obliterate you. Now, for the wicked and for those who reject Christ, the Bible is very clear. The wrath of God abides on them. It lives on them. When you reject the sacrifice that God is offering, God is offering, he's opening this door, his arms are open, saying, come to me. Right? Demons, devils, evil angels saying, don't, no, don't do that. You're not worthy. You can't do that. He's saying, when you put your faith in Christ, trust my sacrifice, come to me. When you reject that 
that open door, that opportunity, the Bible says the wrath of God abides on you. Once again, that's based on your choice, your decision. I say, take the take up the offer. This is Rising Christian Bible Study. Keep in mind that there is only one God in all the universe. There ever is, ever was, and there ever will be. Nothing, anything, anywhere that anyone has worshipped is, was, or will ever be God other than the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel, the Lord God of all heaven and of all earth, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Put your faith and trust in him.